Zimbabwe's harmonized elections held on the 23rd of August 2023 was a complete difference from any other the country has held in the past in its small history as a sovereign state. The plebiscite captured unprecedented global interests like never seen before as forces of numerous agendas jostled to try and ensure their interests came to fruition this time around. Many an electorate of the country failed to realize the plot as Zimbabwe was in actual fact under siege during the process from a well-knit cartel of neoliberals anchored on a bedding of a local force that was easily identifiable to the ordinary men. However, somewhere along the way, as the plan gradually untangled, the plot was discovered and it was unfortunately or fortunately caught in the net of a solid formation built over decades of nurturing, schooling, and experience. The net in this case was the revolutionary party of ZANU-PF, who have always stood sentry since the country attained independence back in 1980 and knew fully well that the interest of the imperialists in regaining control of Zimbabwe one way or the other had never faded away. Welcome to this piece where we focus on Zimbabwe's 2023 elections, what was at stake, the game plan, and the grand regional scheme. For the past five years, Zimbabwe has been on a growth trajectory with its economic transformation having progressed astronomically in a short space of time like never experienced since its independence as the Second Republic under the stewardship of President Emerson Munangagwa has mapped a solid and formidable plan to improve the livelihoods of its nationals. Policies such as devolution have started bearing fruit, transforming the livelihoods of the rural communities who, according to the World Bank, constitute 67.5% four percent of the electorate in Zimbabwe. The evidence of this transformation has been so glaring and also acknowledged by institutions such as the Bretton Woods who have inevitably issued their seal of approval on the economic roadmap. In an unprecedentedly short space of time, projects that would have taken very long to see through, national projects that commenced decades ago, as well as short-term initiatives to put the economy on a growth pedal, have been President Emerson Nangagos trump card as his Build Zimbabwe campaign mantra slowly bears fruit. The country has of late stimulated a lot of interests as an investment destination of choice. Having held its last election in 2018, the country once again had to hold elections in 2023 as its constitution stipulates. Enter the electoral campaign period as numerous political formations expressed interests in facing the main contender, ZANU-PF, in elections that were ushering in new councillors, members of parliament, senators, and a president. For the second time in its history, the country had one of its highest number of presidential candidates, a record 11, as the accommodative administration of President Munanga Gwa created an enabling environment. Opposition parties such as the MDC, CCC, NCA and many other went all out canvassing for votes, tracking every corner of the country unhindered. That's about our name. Yes. Of significant note amongst the opposition was the CCC, the Citizens Coalition for Change, previously the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance. Traditionally identifiable with the Ebonites, the formation which was hastily put in place went all out in its bid to garner support in a very conducive environment that has been prevailing in the country owing to the Second Republic of Zimbabwe. Records provided by the Zimbabwe Republic Police and verified on the ground indicated that the opposition outfit got more political rally approvals than the ruling ZANU-PF acquired as the accommodative leader of Zimbabwe kept preaching the gospel of peace, tolerance and harmony before, during and after the elections. We want our elections to be free of violence. I plead with you it's more important, it's more powerful for us to be peaceful. It's more powerful. It means we are mature. We must preach love. We must preach unity. People are allowed to differ. You must allow your brother, your sister to differ with you, but never be violent because your sister is different with you, because your brother is different with you. No. However, for the opposition, 
In a country that was on such a growth trajectory, there simply was nothing much to sell to the electorate, save for primarily capitalizing on the elevated prices of basic commodities that were timelessly and artificially created in a bid to stimulate dissent amongst the electorate. Still, ZANU-PF read the plot well enough and the majority of the electorate subsequently failed to buy into it too. Elections the world over have been an evolving process that constantly transforms, with new practices being continuously employed to try and improve them. The process, which inevitably can be quite cumbersome, differs with the economic standing of individual countries in aspects such as resource mobilization, accessibility, financial capacity, and stability. Contestations have been known to raise anxiety and are oftentimes a haven of disputes and volatile situations. Not any country under the globe is immune from such incidences or has ever experienced a perfect election. In fact, many have called this a pipe dream. Well-established democracies such as the United States of America have also fallen victim as the 2020 elections runner period pitting the Democrats against the Republicans also bore testimony to how ugly events can quickly turn when Republican sympathizers went on a rampage trying to run down state institutions such as the revered Capitol Hill in protestation, which was a brazen attempt of overturning the outcome of the polls. If such acts could occur in nations such as the USA, how how then would young democracies such as Zimbabwe be totally immune? Election observation and monitoring is another key component of elections initiated since time immemorial in an attempt to enhance global standards of elections and entrench democracy the world over. In this exercise, numerous individuals and groups from outside countries, both regional and international, gather to observe and monitor the election exercise of a host country in a bid to assess the legitimacy of an outcome. However, election observation has also been occasionally fraught of manipulation and misapplication as countries attempt to further their interests and aspirations in the guise of the exercise. Since the year 2000 when Zimbabwe embarked on its land reform exercise to redress a land imbalance that had seen its people displaced during the colonial era, relations have been frosty between Zimbabwe and the West, in particular the US and the UK, who have stopped shy of directly stating they need to see the back of the ruling ZANU-PF party. The bone of contention is that ZANU-PF spearheaded the expropriation of land from the white minority who owned about 70% of all prime land in the country prior. This has also taken toll on even election observation over the years, as these hostilities eventually culminated in Western election observers constantly trying to taint Zimbabwe's electoral processes. As the years progressed after 2000, and as elections were regularly held, the previous administration subsequently ceased extending an invitation of election observation to the hostile West owing to their constantly biased analysis. This has been a calculated plot to unseat the current government viewed as radical towards its quest to reaffirm its economic interests in Zimbabwe. However, in an attempt to improve relations with the West, Zimbabwe has of late resumed inviting Western election observers for the first time in more than 15 years for the 2023 elections, giving them unhindered access to all parts of the country. Little did she know that this time around, the neoliberal forces had camouflaged themselves so well and adopted a revised game plan approaching from within Zimbabwe's neighborhood. They were literally a stone's throw away. The Southern African Development Community, SADC, an intergovernmental organization headquartered in Gaboron, Botswana, is a caucus of 16 countries and was set up with the objective of achieving development and economic growth, the alleviation of poverty, and the enhancement of the livelihoods of the people within, as well as supporting the socially disadvantaged through regional integration. In its quest to ensure this unison, SADA gradually adopted other extraterritorial initiatives such as election observation in order to moderate itself. According to its website, 
The Sadak Electoral Observer Mission, SEOM, is headed by the chairperson of the Sadak Organ on Politics, Defense and Security Cooperation, which is a revolving seat with moderation being carried out by the organ troika of chairpersons of the Ministerial Committee of the Organ and the Sadak Electoral Advisory Council, SEAC. In simpler terms, the Sadak Election Observer Mission carries out an oversight role and their participation in an electoral process is only at the behest of the host country. Country. In view of the above and in light of the body's purpose, the SEOM cannot be seen to be partisan, neither should it adopt any other role outside the election observation and monitoring, as it is not an authority that is empowered to act adversely against any member state. Membership to the SADAC is entirely voluntary. <music> The Rana period saw an unprecedented level of interest in the elections like never witnessed in the country since the attainment of its independence in 1980. Hundreds of NGOs, pressure groups, media organizations, election observers and monitors were all eager to descend on Zimbabwe to witness an election that had so much reinvigorated the hope of the opposition functionaries under the CCC banner after having sold well what they termed as, in quotes, the dawn of a new era. As a sovereign nation with its laws and regulations, the government of Zimbabwe outlined the criteria for the approval of numerous interested parties. During the vetting process, discoveries were also made by the authorities of gross misrepresentations by several of them as even non-terrorist and clandestine pressure groups attempted to enter the country under the guise of religious entities, media organizations or any other form that they felt would ease their entry. The Zimbabwean government, in its quest to foster confidence, openness, and as was tradition, invited numerous election observers to come and monitor the 2023 elections in the country during the pre-election, election, and post-election periods. For the first time in many years, the European Union Observer Mission, which had demonstrated a lot of eagerness to be part of the process, was invited to Zimbabwe as part of observer missions to the polls. A large contingent from the EU immediately deployed to Zimbabwe, where they received unhindered access to all corners of the country. More EU observers were to come on the election day itself to support those already on the ground. Curiously, their main quest was centered on the performance of the opposition CCC as the rallies of the opposition outfit witnessed their permanent presence. Resembling a rock star, the leader of the CCC, Nelson Chamisa, donning fancy shiny trademark designer shirts at all his political rallies walked with an aura of authority for chamisa the level of confidence was high he thought he would finally snatch it this time some of the eu observers demonstrated their brazen direct interests as is this female observer attending an opposition rally in victoria falls going to the extent of even handing over speech notes to their perceived incoming leader of Zimbabwe. This was now their time, they claimed, as terms such as open quotes, God is in it, close quote, and His Excellency President Chamisa became synonymous with their campaigns. But why the sudden interest? What was the explanation behind the immense hope of such unprecedented proportions? Our quest to find out led us to none other than the northern neighbor of Zimbabwe, Zambia. Zimbabwe and Zambia, which share a northern border stretch of about 800 kilometers in length, were at one time part of a single territorial body during the colonial era. Zambia was then northern Rhodesia, with Zimbabwe being southern Rhodesia. The two countries, which share key natural landmarks such as the Victoria Falls and the Zambezi River, also have a rich history connecting them through culture, the struggles for their independence, and certain languages. Their relations have been beyond cordial, as they are very close sister countries. Today, they also share a single border under a one-stop border concept launched to foster their unity and also enjoy a joint visa arrangement for tourists of the Victoria Falls called the Casa. 
The United National Independence Party, UNIP, was at the forefront of the Zambian struggle for independence under the leadership of the founding father of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda. It mainly led under a one-party state setup, which saw Dr. Kaunda wielding a lot of power and influence. Subsequently, four major political parties have transferred power amongst themselves over the past three decades, namely UNIP, MMD, PF, and lately the ruling UPND. The current ruling party of Zambia was founded by the late Anderson Mazoka in 1998 before his subsequent passing in 2006. 12 August 2021 saw elections which ushered in a new leader for Zambia for a party that had mainly been in opposition since its inception. Enter President Hakainde Hichilema. Mr. Hakainde Sami Hichilema. For many years prior to his ascendancy to power, Hakainde Hichilema, popularly referred to as HH in his country, traversed the opposition trenches of Zambia, being a man of near misses in all his previous quests to hold the highest political office in the country. His victory subsequently came in 2021, owing largely to a protest vote due to public disgruntlement towards the then ruling PF party led by President Edgar Lungu. President Hichilema, has had unquestionable historic alliances with the opposition political parties strewn across Africa. The alliances stem from what they collectively coined as a struggle for democracy. The grouping includes the likes of Bobby Wine of Uganda, Musi Maimani of South Africa, the current Lesotho Prime Minister Sam Matekane, and Nelson Chamisa of Zimbabwe, amongst others. Their alliance has been unquestionable, with some of President Hichilema's opposition colleagues attending his inauguration in 2021. To them, this was a significant occasion which marked the beginning of what got to be regarded as a regional paradigm shift, a campaign where they aspire to subsequently unseat all revolutionary movements in the Sadak region primarily, with the aim of fostering the neoliberal rule. If it could happen in Zambia, it could easily be achieved in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, Tanzania and even Angola, they claimed. But who is behind such a well-calculated strategy of bringing together these opposition formations, which also requires extensive funding? Who is responsible for mobilizing such significant funds, in particular from Western sympathizers, for the onslaught against these revolutionary movements? It is none other than the Brenthurst Foundation, a creation of the infamous Oppenheimer family of South Africa. Their website defines them as a think tank seeking ways to fund African development, touting themselves as a frontier of new ideas and innovative actions for strengthening Africa's economic performance. Using its financial muscle, the foundation has successfully canvassed for support from some former African leaders and African scholars to give credence to its agenda. After their victory in Zambia, they thought, you know, the region could turn so easily. Mr. Akainde Hichilema here, he's sponsored by the Anglo-American Corporation Foundation, the Brentes Foundation, run by the Oppenheimers. That sponsors the DA in South Africa. That sponsors Bobby White in Uganda. That sponsored... Laira Odinga in the last elections in Kenya. After their victory in Zambia, they thought they would roll over the region. But Zimbabwe is not Zambia. Although we are neighbors, we are one people. There was a liberation struggle that was waged there, an armed struggle. It's a product of a revolutionary process. And it has to be defended, and people are defending it. President Hakainde Hichilema himself is widely regarded as having very close ties to the Brenthurst Foundation, which allegedly assisted him on numerous occasions during his campaign period. The bond that exists between him and his colleagues who work closely with the foundation is solid as ever. For the first, first time in the history of our country, of 
ended up with a, a, a president who's uh, causing our standing globally at continental level and in the SADC region to degenerate to levels um, where the respect and the, the honor that Zambia has enjoyed over the years, especially looking at the role that Zambia played through our founding father, uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda. Uh, I can tell you that we are working with our heads buried in our palms out of shame because this president that we have is a puppet of imperialists. The 43rd Ordinary Session of the SADC Heads of State and Government was held on the 17th of August in Luanda, Angola. It is during this summit that President Hichilema was elected chairperson of the Organ on Politics, Defense and Security Cooperation. This coincided with the elections which were to be held in Zimbabwe on the 23rd of August 2023. As the incumbent chair of the Organ, President Hichilema was mandated with appointing the head of mission to the elections in Zimbabwe in accordance with the SADC stipulations. The head of mission was to lead a team of observers drawn from several SADC countries as well as other SADC caucuses to come and observe the election pre, during and post period. Enter Nevers Mumba. I want you to welcome the former Vice President of Zambi, Zambia, Apostle Nevers Mumba. Let's welcome him here to this house. Hallelujah. Nevers Mumba, a Zambian politician whose political career spans over two decades, has not been immune from controversy. Almost all politicians and civic leaders I encountered in Lusaka and beyond had a story to tell about the infamous figure who had just headed a SADC election observer mission to Zimbabwe, releasing a preliminary report fraught with a lot of irregularities. All of us in Zambia, from the onset, uh, we did echo that he was a misfit in the, and a compromised uh, person to undertake that assignment. Why, com why do we say compromised? Is because uh, for me, I know that uh, uh, President Akande Ichirema who appointed him and himself, myself, at some point attempted to go into a political alliance in opposition, particularly in 2014 after uh, we had the presidential by-election as a result of the death of uh, the then president, Michael Chigufiasat. And uh, President Daka in the um, was being sponsored, and I think continued to be sponsored, by some of these imperialist organizations like the Brentwood, you know, Brent Trust Foundation, the Oppenheimers, and the Beers, and all these. And we happened to have at, uh, a meeting in South Africa at the facility of the Oppenheimers. We were shocked to find that uh, in a country like Zimbabwe, where clearly the Brentas Foundation has an interest, uh, the president would choose this time around, President Akainde um a guy or a gentleman like uh, Nevers Mumba, who is basically, uh, you know, drinking from the same, you know, chalice, if you like of the Brentas Foundation, to which we also know that uh, the young man in Zimbabwe, uh, Chamisa, is also part of that outfit. We know agents of this imperialist organization in the region. We know that the NDC were being supported and Cham, you know, uh, supported by that outfit because we have, we had um, forums and programs to which uh, Bobby Wine of Uganda, Chamisa of Zimbabwe, uh, the, D, the one who was the leader of the DA in South Africa, Maimani, and others, were part of this whole congregation together with Mr. Akainde HM. And from the MMD, Nevers was the one who was basically knocking at the door of that uh, you know, outfit so that you could possibly benefit.
My quest of tracing the roots of Nevers Mumba as an individual was simply motivated by the controversy he had individually stirred in Harare, which was in sharp contrast to the diplomatic tone accustomed to election observatory work in Africa, historically meant to foster regional unity. His scathing attack on the country, including its constitutionally enacted laws, which went through the same elective process as elections he was coming to preside over, was simply so telling. Ambassador Emmanuel Mwamba has held several diplomatic positions in Africa, having been an ambassador of Zambia to both South Africa and Ethiopia. He has also been an election observer within the Sadak region on several occasions. Looking at the report, I can tell you that he went, he went overboard. He went outside his mandate. Him in person or with the mission, I don't know what they are doing because they are guidelines. For example, the role of um, SADC when they walk or the African Union when they come into your country, they want to understand if you are sticking to your own constitution, if you are sticking to your own electoral act, if you are sticking to your, your own e electoral guidelines, and whether you are meeting these standards. For example, fair coverage, participation of candidates, how accessible are they to, if you have a public media, how is the interaction? So there are these standards. We hold you by your standards. We don't criticize your standards. So the mistake of this report is, for example, to criticize issues of the Constitution, to uh, cast doubt about the delimitation process. Those are internal domestic process. And the Sadiq Observer mission in their preliminary report cited things are outside their mandate. Much as he tried to pass this sentiment as a collective effort by the whole Sadak region, that narrative simply failed to sell. Mr. Kainde, before even taking over the chairmanship of the Troika, he had appointed Mr. Mr. Sumumba to be the chairperson. Before the meeting in Angola, it's there on record, you can check his Facebook page. Why did he appoint Mr. Nevers Mumba? Mr. Nevers Mumba is also close to the Brentes Foundation of the Grain Mills and others. He's part of their league. He's close to Nelson Chamisa. His objectivity is impaired by his association. And it came out very clearly in the behavior of Mr. Mumba. And I don't think some of the things they were saying or you were saying represent the, the group that was leading or chairing. It's sad. Zimbabwe conducted elections that were not different in their conduct from the rest of the continent. The elections that took place last week in Zimbabwe are not different from the Kenyan elections. They are not different from the DRC elections. They are not different from the elections we had in Angola. They are not even different from the elections we had in Mozambique. Why is Zimbabwe being singled out for victimization, for defamation, for slander? The reason is simple, because they want their own puppets to take over Zimbabwe. The more information I unearthed about Nevers Mumba in Lusaka, the more my journalistic instinct kicked in, and I suddenly found myself even more curious to establish how his early days were like. Inevitably, I embarked on a 370-kilometer trek along the precarious Great North Road, headed to the town of Kitwe in the Copper Belt province of Zambia. This, I had been told, was where I would trace his origins. A quick Google map search had given the estimated travel time between Lusaka and Kitwe as six hours. However, having departed Lusaka at 6.30 a.m., our arrival there was only at 1,500 hours after braving the scorching savanna heat. In this town, Nevers Mumba began his pastoralship work, having arrived as a young man from up north in Chinsale. Riverside is a location to the northeast of Kitwe town. This property in Riverside, suburb of Kitwe, was initially owned by a European widow and her children who lived abroad 
who agreed to accommodate Nevers Mumba for the greater part of his youthful life. Subsequently, after the passing of the widow, the property became subject of a gruesome legal battle as Nevers Mumba and the deceased widow's children logged horns over the ownership of the property. Mumba had seen an opportunity after the demise of the poor old lady to clandestinely assume ownership of the property since the immediate beneficiaries were all based abroad. Dr. Nevers Mumba, the man from the word go is a betrayer, is a man that does not uh, say the truth, um, and you will see it throughout uh, his public life. His public life starts from when he was uh, a pastor. And um, I think he, you know, he, he was helped by a certain man, you know, when he was at his uh, young age, you know, to become a pastor. And then he was sent out, um, after which he came back and married, you know, uh, this woman who I think was somehow close to the person that was uh, helping him. Some people helped him with a house in Kitwe and uh, he was running his ministries, you know, uh, Victory Ministries, you know, and he had a wonderful program uh, called Zambia Shall Be Saved. Uh, a, a, a very good preacher, I must say. Zambians really enjoyed, uh, you know, the sermons of uh, uh, Dr. Mumba at that point. And he gained popularity, you know, this is uh, in, the, in the 90s. All of a sudden, he formed his own political party. Because Nevers Mumba likes, is a maglomaniac, you know, he likes it big and he will do anything <laughs> to get that attention. Mumba grew to become a preacher of note in Zambia under the stewardship of an American German Pentecostal evangelist by the name of Reynard Bonke. He then eventually founded the Victory Bible Church. In the next episode, we shed more light on Nevers Mumba, his political journey and the plot to sanitize the election observation charade. We also delve into the well-calculated neoliberal plot currently at play in the Sadak region. This is the Grand Regional Scheme.